Welcome back to our, our videos on model assessment. In this video, I'm going to cover the third step in model assessment, is, which is then doing some sort of quantitative skill assessment. This is following on the first two steps of just doing uh, basic sanity checks on your model and model output, and then doing uh, visual, qualitative, uh, graphical assessments of, of model performance between model and data. And the third is to put some sort of skill score on that. Uh, model performance. Uh, so some very common examples of skill scores that we use to assess model performance are, are many of these are related to this kind of the basic summary statistics we learned when we uh, were trying to understand patterns in data by themselves. Uh, so one particularly common one is the the root mean squared error RMSE, um, which is a great it's a it's a mouthful but it's a great name for a statistic because it tells you exactly what it is. Uh, because you know, first, let's work at it from uh, kind of backwards, from, from right to left. Error. So remember error, uh, you know, we talked about that when we were talking in linear models, when we were defining residuals. Error is just the difference between uh, what was observed and what was predicted uh, by the model. So if error is that difference between the model and the data, square error is that error squared. Um, so we take the error and we squared it. For the, and this is for all the same reasons that we talked about in regression is because it gives us a penalty that uh, you can, can lead, leads to a unique solution. Uh, it doesn't just talk, tell us about canceling errors. And um, it penalizes larger errors more than small errors. So we're, you know, a model that has a lot of tiny, little tiny errors isn't necessarily one that we worry about. But you know, ones that has you know, large outliers are things that we are often more concerned about representing. You know, things we really screwed up. Um, okay, so we take, and then we have this idea of squared error. And so the next is mean. We literally are taking the mean of the squared error. So we're summing up all of the errors for all the different data points, and then we're dividing it by n. And now, like when I talk, told you about uh, variances, because this squared error, this mean squared error, essentially is a variance. Uh, the units on that are going to be in units of squared, you know, x or y, whatever, I mean, whatever your, your model's representing. So we then take the square root of that to get it back to uh, the same scale as our data, uh, so, which means a root mean squared error is essentially a standard deviation, and it is, and it's the standard deviation of the distribution of the residuals. Uh, which is another way of thinking about it. And actually, that's really the ideal way of thinking about it. If you, if you, if you plotted the histogram of your model's residuals, this is uh, the standard deviation of that distribution. Um, yeah, and like I said, root mean squared error is literally telling you square root of a mean of a square of an error. Cool. Uh, bias. We talked conceptually about bias <coughs> um, Earlier, you know, it's when the model is systematically off from the data, um, and this is really kind of, uh, you know, kind of just uh, calculated by just calculating uh, the the mean error. So we, when we talked about the regression model, we said, you know, oh, you know, uh, you know, if errors in one direction, errors in another direction, you know, do they cancel out or not? Um, the other way we can sometimes understand bias is if we fit a regression on that one-to-one -one plot, uh, that the slope of that regression on a one-to-one -one plot tells us, you know, that should be one. So departures from that slope being one indicate a multiplicative error in the model and departures of that intercept. Uh, so if the slope was one-to-one, -one, uh, then departures of that intercept would represent an additive bias. In, in reality, when you fit that linear regression, you're going to have both. And so uh, it's not, you know, you can't necessarily assess bias just from fitting that line uh, to the predicted observed. Um, but yeah, it kind of is just the mean error. Uh, correlation coefficient. Um, actually can jump ahead to a slide here showing, just reminding you kind of uh, to get a feel for correlation. You know, when there's zero correlation, there's no relationship. Uh, between two things. You know, previously, we were kind of often looking at that re as a relationship between two variables. Like when we were doing our, building our regression models, here we're thinking about it in terms of the correlation between the predictions and the observations. So if there's no relationship between the predictions and the observations, your model is clearly not doing well. Um, 
and we want that you know relationship ideally to be um, as close to one as possible you know and in this case a correlation a negative correlation is also troublesome because it means when your model predicts something to be high you actually observe it to be low and vice versa um, so you know it's the correlation increases in strength as the magnitude increases and it maximizes at one for a perfect positive correlation, positive slope co correlation, and, and negative one for a perfect negative slope correlation. Um, and some things you can do with models is, is assess correlations uh, in different ways, kind of get creative with this like we did with making plots. So here's an example of looking at the correlation uh, uh, between uh, predicted and observed aspects in an atmospheric model. In this case, it's particularly height of a, a pressure level in the atmosphere, which is one that's very representative of, of the model's overall skill and ability to capture weather, weather patterns. Uh, and here we're seeing uh, how uh, the correlation between uh, what was predicted and what was observed actually increased in time as the skill of the model improved. Um, and this is, you know, the correlation predictions observed in weather forecast uh, three days out. So that, you know, that even, uh, you know, about 15 years ago was still, um, you know, pretty close to one, showing you just the really high skill of, of weather forecasts on these shorter time scales. And we can see that those correlations uh, decline as the forecast goes further and further out. We also see this general increase in skill, you know, that we're now you know, you know, I guess in, uh, when this graph ended around 2006, you know, a five-day forecast uh, was, a, you know, equivalent to uh, a three-day forecast in the 80s, and a seven-day forecast was equivalent to like a five-day forecast in the 80s, and kind of showing this that overall, like this increase uh, in skill by, you know, two to three days. Uh, since the 80s, and then also a convergence between the northern and southern hemispheres. You know, in the past, we did predictions were consistently worse in the southern hemisphere, which is uh, in some part a, a large reflection of the fact that there's just less land in the southern hemisphere, so there's less meteorological stations. You have these large oceans, um, larger ocean ocean fraction, so less observations. Um, yeah, so kind of showing how we can use error statistics. Uh, not just as summary tables. And, and in general, I'll, I'll say this uh, when it comes to the quantitative skills assessments as well. Anytime we can visualize those, they're often much easier to interpret. And one of the least uh, useful things that I find in a, any paper on a model is just, you know, tables with error statistics in them because you kind of stare at them and go, I, I don't know. Um. <clears throat> uh, OK, so we talked about correlation uh, R squared. We've talked about that in the regression context. It's the uh, percentage of the variance uh, explained by the model, normalized by the uh, the variance in the observations. Uh, so it's literally you know one minus uh, the residual variance over the variance in the y variable. Um, and and important to note out that that when you do that R squared and the calculation between uh, the model's residuals and the observations, that that is the essentially equivalent to the R squared around the one-to-one -one line on the predicted observed. And that's important to note because you will find some publications that will uh, make a predicted observed plot, have data that's not following on that predicted observed plot at all, then fit a regression, and then calculate the R squared around that. So they're kind of calculating the R squared around a, the bias corrected version of the model. Because in reality, some models can have zero skill, uh, you know, they, they, in the sense that they're not doing any better than chance at predicting uh, the, the data because of systematic biases. And uh, this is actually where correlation versus R squared can be helpful because you could have a model that is, is well correlated uh, with the observations, but is biased in some way or miscalibrated in some way. Um, so you're getting a high correlation, but your model is still wrong. And so I, I think it's important to distinguish those two skill scores. Uh, that this really should be a measure of, of true skill, not just a, an equivalent of correlation. 
Um, and then again, regression slope is telling us about bias. Um, I think one thing that's useful to think about in terms of error statistics is what they are telling you about in terms of accuracy and precision. And accuracy and precision are really important concepts in model assessment, even if you're not calculating error statistics, uh, because they tell there's kind of two different aspects of assessment. And so one is about um, kind of the overall accuracy of the model in terms of how close is it getting to the truth. Um, and so you know, here's an estimate of uh, these points are in, in panel A, are far away from the, in this case, you're envisioning the target as being the truth. Um, this one in panel B, they're just as far away. So both the accuracy is equivalent in A and B because the, the darts here are just as far away from the bullseye, uh, but they differ in precision. So uh, in A, they're, not only they're far away, but they're also scattered all over the place. Um, and if we think of that scatter as a reflection of the, say, the compass interval or the distribution, um, it's, it's wide. By, this case, by contrast, in panel B, uh, there's high precision. So the model's predictions are very clustered, but they're clustered around the wrong value. And in this way, this is kind of a representation of systematic bias. And the model's making a very tight uh, compass interval, but it may be very different from reality. Um, by contrast, you know, here is an example of a similarly tight clustering of the predictions, but they're clustered around um, the true value. And then here we have the you know, kind of the best world where you're both accurate, uh, you know, you're getting the right values and you're precise, you're confident uh, about those, those values. And yeah, so you kind of want D and you really don't want B. Uh, and if you, if you have a model that is, is not accurate, you kind of almost want the uncertainty in that model to represent that. You don't want this where you're confident about something that's wrong. Because in my mind, that's kind of the worst thing you want to be, is to be confidently wrong. Uh, <laughs> OK, so, so I talked a, a, a little bit before um, about uh, visualizing error statistics. And this, this graph here uh, is, is a little bit complicated. It takes a while to get your head around, but is uh, um, I think a great example of trying to come up with creative ways to visualize these error statistics, not just stick them in a table. So this is called a Taylor diagram. And each point on this diagram represents uh, a different, the performance of a, of a model, uh, and these are, are land models, like we've been talking about land models, uh, in terms of, um, three different error statistics. And, and they kind of come out in this polar plot because the three error statistics are related to each other. So you know, if you knew two of them, you actually know the third. And they are, an important thing to note is this point here on the x-axis uh, labeled A is where the observed data lies. And so you know, kind of what you want to do is be as close to the observed data as possible. OK, so if that's the observed data, the, these rays coming out in the polar plot um, represent different correlation coefficients. So if you're on the x-axis here, you have a correlation coefficient of one. If you're on the y-axis here, you have a correlation coefficient of zero. And kind of the angle of these rays reflects the correlation coefficient. The other thing we see are these green circles, which are contours of root mean squared error. And so uh, the, the, if, you're, if you have zero root mean squared error you're on top of the data, the error between the data and itself is zero. Um, and so these are contours of root mean squared error. So uh, these points kind of follow along this first contour all have a very similar root mean squared error close to about 0.5. Uh, the ones that the rest of the cloud kind of falls between 0.5 and 1. You have this one guy out here, F, that's got a you know, uh, root mean squared error of about you know, 1.2. And so really, you're, you know, your distance from A is a measure of that, that root mean squared error, which again is just the, the standard deviation of the residuals. 
Um, so then the third part of this is these other contours that are di the distance from the zero, zero. And that's, these are contours of what's called standard deviation ratio. <clears throat> and what that is, is the variability uh, in the model relative to the variability in the data. And so you can think about it this way. Imagine that, uh, you know, I talked about earlier, um, models tend to damp over all the wiggles in the data. So if I you know, were to plot a time series of data and has lots of wiggles in it, and I could measure you know, how variable, you know, you, you know, how, you know the model's going up and down, uh, the data's going up and down. If the model and the data are going up and down the same amount, uh, then they have the same, the, the ratio of those, those uh, that variability is, is one, and that's this contour, this, labeled one that goes, it starts at A and kind of loops around. Um, anything that's above that contour represents a case where um, the model is predicting more wiggles than are seen in the data. Uh, so the model, and this could be because the model's amplitude is off, it's just going up and down too much, or it's, you know, it's predicting responses that aren't really there, but you're seeing more variability in the model response than you are in the data. Um, and a few models are doing that, and we see more models below that curve, which is cases where the model is showing less variability in the data. The model's damping over those responses. Um, so you could imagine, you know, you have this cluster uh, of, of fairly well-performing models. Here they have a similar coefficient, coefficient, co sim similar correlation coefficient, similar root mean squared error, but they're varying from uh, the, the left-hand side of, of this cluster, this lowest cluster, which is really damping uh, the variability to the right-hand, which is exacerbating the variability, and then the ones kind of in between that are, are getting the variability right, they're doing a decent correlation and uh, a decent uh, root mean squared error. So they're kind of telling us a bit about, you know, in some ways do, doing fairly well. Actually, an interesting thing on this plot are plot points O and P, which are, are various versions of a multi-model average. Uh, so this is averaging over all of these other models. And you actually see a phenomena here, which is actually not uncommon, uh, which is the, the average over a bunch of models actually performs better than, than many of the individual models. And I would say performs better than most of the models in the average. So you, you know, and this is, there's no you know, real theoretical proof for why this occurs, and it doesn't necessarily always occur. But it does occur a lot, and it's often a reflection that um, if you have a bunch of different models that make a bunch of different assumptions, often the errors in the models cancel each other out. So um, yeah, it, it's just a useful uh, thing for making practical predictions in the real world is if you have a bunch of models that averaging over them often performs well, and sometimes can perform better than even the best model. <coughs> So to kind of come back to the big picture, um, I want to talk, think about kind of uh, what information we're using to test models against. So, so usually we start with the, the data we use to calibrate the model. And that's, you know, that would be kind of a, what's called an in-sample test. You know, I fit a model to data and see how well it actually captured that data. So that's kind of looking at the residuals from the original data that's fit. And that tells us something about the model's performance, but it really what it tells us about the model's performance is, is limited to that in-sample scope, that, that original data. And it doesn't tell us whether this model can predict uh, new, in, new pieces of information. So it, it's really important not just to do this model data assessment against the data that it was fit against, but to do additional verification or validation where you compare uh, data compare your model to, to, to other data beyond just the data that was fit to. As you explore a larger range of variability in the real world than, than just what the, what's available to you for calibration. And sometimes this can be done by uh, subsetting your original data into a calibration fraction and a validation fraction. Uh, even better is if you have truly independent data collected uh, you know, by uh, you know, a different team and different methods and can often you know, kind of uh, reveal uh, a lot of detail. You know, I guess the point would be <clears throat> data collected by one team might, ha might have 
might share any sort of measurement biases that that team has. Uh, and external data can be even stronger uh, validation. Um, and it also, and, and then to remember that uh, applications to the model outside of the space that it was calibrated and validated for is, is an extrapolation. And that uh, you need to be cautious when extrapolating models. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it. I would say the degree to which you would want to do it might depend a lot on how much you actually understand the process and trust your model's representation of structure. So, you know, simple statistical models are going to extrapolate uh, less well than um, you know, mechanistic models that represent process. Uh, machine learning models are particularly uh, can be particularly challenged to extrapolate with because they can be very easy to uh, kind of uh, they, you know, they have a tendency to try to capture wiggles even if they're not there. They they have it. It can be easy to overfit with machine learning models. Um, and it's also important to kind of think about when you do your validation uh, to see whether their model is actually performing this uh, just as well everywhere. So this gradient was added to represent that maybe maybe the model's skill is is uh, higher on the right hand side of this environmental space than on the left hand side, and that might be a physical space or it might be with regard to specific inputs. But again, teasing those things out from uh, these quantitative and qualitative error statistics and, and model data comparisons that understand like in what conditions is your model performing better, in what conditions is your model performing worse. And if I were, for example, to, to use the, this particular model for extrapolation, I would be much more confident extrapolating it into new conditions that are along the right-hand side than I would into new conditions that are on the left-hand side, because I already know the model's not performing well under that set of conditions. And if I push it even further, it's not likely to perform well. OK, so that kind of wraps up the big picture about uh, model validation in a general sense. And the, the next last lecture in this uh, series, I'm going to dive into some of the specifics of, of some of the additional things you want to do when validating uh, statistical models. So a lot of what I've talked about so far is generic to any sort of model, but I'm going to dive into some of the details of things you want to check on statistical models.